And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Merry Christmas. It looks as though you have survived the end of the world. But have you survived Christmas shopping? Uh, this weekend was crazy, wasn't it? I mean, that's the time I start my shopping is on this weekend. And so I went out and I couldn't find a parking place anywhere at the Shell station. Uh, <laughs> But I got it all taken care of, and we're, we're happy for that. So my name is Scott Thomas, one of the pastors here at The Journey, and it is my great joy and pleasure to open up the Scripture and look in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 21, and peek into just a couple of verses at least that will help to explode who Jesus Christ is in your life. Well, happy holidays. Those are two words that are kind of an oxymoron, right? Uh, happy and holidays don't typically go together. I mean, you get with people that you don't normally get with. You don't choose to get with your family sometimes. Some of you do. But you're shoved into a little small room, have meals together, and spend long times and hours together, and happy and holidays don't always go together. Conflict sometimes arises like it did in my family. Uh, we have a large family, and all of my siblings are hard-headed, except for me, of course. And so when we get together, it typically goes down like this. We, we open up presents, we open up our mouth, we open up a can, and then we stop talking to each other for months. That's conflict that takes place. Merry Christmas indeed, right? But that first Christmas was different. First Christmas brought peace. It's Jesus Christ who brought that first peace. He was born as the Savior of the world to give glory to God and bring peace to the whole world. The problem is that we seek saviors in many other things in our lives in order to experience just a glimpse of peace. Things that we think are important, we take into our life and we begin to explore those things and thinking that are they are saviors. They may be our children. They may be our athletics. They may be our work. It may be our hobbies. It could be just vegging and doing things and playing video. It, it, whatever we do, we seek saviors in our life just to give us a glimpse of some peace in our life. But Jesus is the only one who brings real, lasting, everlasting peace in our life. And he brings it in three ways. Peace with ourself, peace with God, and peace with others. And the peace was broken with God. In the beginning, peace was broken. And God made man and woman and all of creation, and he said, this is very good. And then man and woman sinned, and they took of that forbidden fruit, and they ate of it. And, they were, and God came to meet Adam in the cool of the day as he had normally done. And he walked in the garden, and he called out for Adam and could not find him. And when he inquired of Adam where he was, he said, 
I was naked and ashamed and I hid myself. And so we find mankind hiding because of the brokenness, the peace that has been broken. It doesn't exist between God and man any longer because of our sin. Isaiah 59 tells us that our sins have separated us between God and us. And further in that chapter, it explores the idea that peace eludes us, and no man knows peace who lives in this broken relationship with God. And so God sent judges to the world. He sent these judges to warn men of their their deeds and their wrongdoings. He sent kings to rule over them, and still they sinned. He sent prophets to tell and proclaim who Jesus Christ was and the Messiah that was going to be coming and to to warn them but also to tell them about that coming King who will be brought to us. And then he was silent. God sent these kings and judges and, and prophets and he spoke through them and then he was silent. For 400 years, between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament, that 400 years, God did not speak through prophets, through kings, through judges. He was silent. No word. And so they took over the rule of Persia, began to rule, and there was not peace by being ruled over by Persia. And Alexander the Great conquered Persia, and the Greeks began to rule over the Israelites, and it divided them. It separated them. And then after his death, the Romans came, and they ruled over Israelites, and through the Caesars, they controlled and they governed them, and they persecuted them, and they brought them great pain and discomfort. And that's the time that we find Luke chapter 2 is right here at this time. God has not spoken for 400 years. We have not heard from him. We have heard told about him, and we've tried to pass this along from generation to generation. And yet some of our family have left. Some have divided and gone another way. Some have abandoned it altogether. But yet we hold this hope within us. And then God spoke. And the way that he spoke was, in this time his good news came out. And Luke chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do you understand how important that was? What kind of announcement that was when God spoke through this angel and said, today I bring you this good news of great joy. It shall be for all people. I tell you, I'm breaking the silence. God is now speaking once again, and he's speaking and saying, his son has come. The Messiah has come. The child we've been looking for has come. He is born this day in the city of Bethlehem. It should bring great joy and peace to all those who were a part of that. And so God came to mankind. God sent judges. He sent kings. He sent prophets. But God himself came. Jesus Christ is God incarnate, meaning God in the flesh. He is God. He's the Son of God, but co-equal with God. He is God. God in the flesh. And Matthew tells us that he, Matthew 1, 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We have God with us in the flesh, in the form of an unusual way, a baby born to a virgin woman and brought to this world to be the king of kings and prince of peace and we are worshiping before him. And then God put it in the heart, the wicked Caesar, Caesar Augustus, to tax the whole world. And so he, he called for them to go back to their hometown to pay taxes. And Joseph, betrothed to Mary, not yet 
married, engaged as it were, but legally bound. They came to his hometown of Bethlehem. This very pregnant young girl, very pregnant young girl, leaves Nazareth with Joseph, and they traveled to Bethlehem to pay taxes. The only reason they were there were to pay taxes. Otherwise, you, you shouldn't travel in this condition. But God saw fit that the Caesar would demand of it and be very hard and cause this child to be born in Bethlehem, for it was prophesied in Micah 5, 2, that in Bethlehem shall this son come, this child, this offspring shall come forth out of Bethlehem. And so he came. And we give glory to God. It says, chapter 2, verse 14, a mob, a flash mob, if you will, broke out. And it says, the multitude of angels of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. One angel came and announced his birth. It took a whole group of people, a whole heavenly host, to come and say, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace among those whom he's pleased. This is our praise to God. It ascends from man to God. And from God to man descends peace. We give glory, he gives peace. We receive peace, we give more glory. And he fills our hearts with that peace that comes only from him. Well, who receives it? I mean, who can have this peace? And we find that he offered this peace to all, but only those who receive Jesus Christ by their faith and trust in him as their Savior and Lord will be the ones who receive this peace. Who needs it? Who, who needs the peace? And the answer is very simple everyone. Everyone needs peace. If we've ever sinned, we've been separated from God. Our sins, our iniquities, our evil thoughts, our wicked deeds, even if they are not horrific, they are a transgression. They are a mark against us. They are a charge and a debt that we owe. And so we're separated from God. And this peace is only brought about through Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, that peace can never be reconciled. That debt will be never paid without Jesus Christ. And so let's look at three ways. Peace with God. Peace with ourself. And peace with others. Now, normally, we respond to peace with others because we have conflict with others. Right? We have conflict with others, and we try, to, we try to fix that. We try to bring some semblance of, of peace in our life. As we gather together, there's a lack of peace. There's conflict. There's war. There's fightings among us, and we seek to have peace with one another. But we can't have peace with one another until we have peace within ourselves. Because you know those people that do not have peace within themselves, that it's always churning. There's always some problem. There's always fightings within themselves. They're causing problems with other people. And sometimes they don't even know it. And you can't have peace within yourself, though, unless you have peace with God. So this is foundational to have peace with God. C.S. Lewis said it this way, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There's no such thing. No such thing as peace apart from God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 gives us a hint. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, since we've been justified by faith, what does that mean? that we have been paid up in full by faith. We didn't pay it. We by faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ. So it says through 
our Lord Jesus Christ. We have, by faith, we've been paid up in full through Jesus Christ, and what do we experience? Peace with God. Since we have been justified by this faith through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. It declares us right. It says you're paid up in full. You don't have to pay it. You don't have to keep working at it. We're made right through this faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone, not faith in ourselves and what we can add to it. He's paid it on the cross. He said it is finished. That word means it's paid in full. His death on the cross paid it in full. Totally eradicated your debt. And by faith in Him, when you put your faith in Him, your debt is paid. By the payment of Christ, a payment we should have paid. But God, through His great love and His great mercy, brought peace to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And He said, we can be right once again through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus enables and assures this peace. He both makes it possible, he assures it, and he keeps it and maintains it. It's not up to us. Because you're going to have conflict within yourself. You're going to have conflict with others. You're going to have doubt with God. There's going to be sin in your life that you're going to do that's going to go, I'm separated from God. There's a problem here. And But through Jesus Christ, he enables, he assures this. And we are at peace forever. With God, we are at peace with Him. We may do wrong, we're still at peace because we are a child of God. We're His. So we have this peace with God, and that enables peace within ourselves. The Apostle Paul tells us this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about what? Anything. I don't like that verse. I mean, it just barely got started, and I don't like it. Do not be anxious about anything. All right, what other provisions do you have, Lord, except your family, your health, your finances, your job, your relationships, Okay, so do not be anxious about anything except these things. Lord, you got to give me something. If he said, do not be anxious about everything, I'm going like, well, I'm cool there. I mean, I'm not anxious about any sports teams in San Francisco. I'm not anxious. I don't care. But he said, don't be anxious about what? Anything. So what do we do with our anxiety? Because it still exists, right? I mean, you could tell me that. It's like telling, like, stop it. You've told your kids that before. Like, just stop it. I'm like, I can't help myself. I just got to do this stuff. And we're the same way. It's not enough just to say, do not be anxious. All right, settled? Are we settled? No more anxiety in your life? It doesn't work that way, does it? What do we do? So we follow up with, the anxiety does exist when we feel this anxiety, but in everything by prayer and supplication, hold on to these words, with thanksgiving. How do we, how do we pray to God with thanksgiving? We have anxiety. Trouble comes to our life. Anxiety hits us. We feel that pit in our stomach. It just feels like... Something is burning. What do we do? We're thankful, right? You don't experience that? Thankful. Why? Because we're a child of God. Because we have someone to go to. Because we have peace with God. Don't be anxious about anything, but everything by prayer and supplication. With an attitude of thanks because we know we serve a sovereign God who cares for us and we're at peace with Him. He is not our enemy. We're not fighting with Him. He is working 
with us and through us and through our trial and our anxiety. He said, let your requests be made known to God. We just dump them all on him. I'm tired, Lord. I'm sick, Lord. My family is troubling me. I, just lacking finances. I'm disturbed at my workplace. My, on and on it goes, right? We let our requests be made known to God. And what happens? And the peace of your mind and grasping what's going on properly shall guard your hearts and minds. No? Am I, did I get it wrong? And the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, all reasoning. It's not your peace. It's not peace that there is no trouble, no trial, no circumstance. It's the peace of God. I don't need peace with another person. I need peace of God. I need his peace to come on me, and I need it to surpass my understanding. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how to survive. Honestly, I was going through a hard time some months ago, and I sat with my family, and, and we were getting ready to eat, and we were preparing to pray. And I just kind of made an announcement. I said, we're either going to get through this, and we're just going to look back and go, duh, look how great God is. Or something terrible is going to happen to me. And they all looked at me and said, what? And they, just, they banned me from the shed. Don't go out to the shed. Just, you can't go out there. What I was trying to say is we can't understand what's going on. We can't fix it in our mind. It surpasses reasoning understanding. And that peace of God, not the understanding, but the peace of God, will guard our hearts and minds. It, it guards not only our heart, Oh, I'm feeling this. It guards our heart and it guards our minds. We call on him to give us that. Oh, this time of year brings a whole bunch of internal battles, doesn't it? Um, you think about family. You think about maybe those who aren't there. My brother died two years ago. We were a year apart. We did everything together. Everything. And we'll never do anything together again. I keep a little vial of his ashes on my desk. I'm not sure why exactly, but I, I just didn't know where else to put them. And I'm reminded of the memories we have together, and I'm also bring sometimes sorrow to know we're never going to be able to do those things again, particularly at Christmas time when you gather together. I'm sorrowful over his two teenage kids who for the second Christmas in a row, and I'll get to see them. We'll not have a dad. My dad just got out of the hospital after about 20 days, had a back surgery. My mom's over, he's 83. My mom's 80. She's very frail. She's trying to take care of him. Um, it's hard on them, and it's hard on me to hear her and be so many miles away. I can't do anything about it brings anxiety, brings stress to my life. What do I do with those things? I have to call on the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. You say, well, I don't, I don't struggle like that. Now, how do you respond when an unexpected bill comes? How do you respond when the doctor says, I'd like you to come into my office and have a, have a meeting? Bring your immediate family. How do you handle those guilty feelings in your life? How do you handle the call from the school concerning your child? Anxiety will, in fact, happen, won't it? And we have the promise that God will guard our hearts and minds through that. And we also have the promise and the plea from God, give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Let your requests be made known to me and the peace of God which surpasses your understanding. You can't fix this. will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's good news. And that's what we have. So we have this 
peace with ourselves. And sometimes we, circumstances are okay, but we still doubt ourselves. We've got to have that peace within us to know that inner peace is we're forgiven. We're a child of God. We're adopted as children of God, and we are loved by Him completely and fully, even though He knows us absolutely. That's pretty exciting. And we have to cling on to this. We have to hold on to this, that this is who He declares us to be. And the peace is with God, and then the peace is within ourself. And finally, it enables to have peace with others. But it doesn't guarantee it. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If possible, hold those words. If possible. It isn't always possible, according to the Apostle Paul, to live peaceably with all. There are some people who either are not ready or they do not have any peace within themselves, or they do not have peace with God. There's just a problem. You cannot do it, no matter what you do. But it says, so far as it depends on you, seek to live peaceably with all men. Do what you can. And then what do you do? Three things. You you realize that God forgave you of sin, great sin and continues to forgive you of that sin and all the other sins that are in your life on an ongoing basis. Thank God for, and so having this forgiveness, we get to display that. We're not displaying our goodness. We're displaying or mirroring or imaging His goodness. As it were, like you had a mirror, you are mirroring it to other people. It's not your goodness. It's not your forgiveness. It's not your love and understanding. It's His because you don't have any at the time. You don't understand why, again, they did this. But we get to mirror this to other people. And we need to remind ourselves of the peace that we have with God. That no matter what, if I don't have a right relationship with someone here, it doesn't affect the relationship I have with God. If I have done all as it depends upon me to live peaceably with all men, he'll remind us, He'll discipline us. He'll correct us. But as a father, not as a mean judge, ruler. And then finally, we rest. We just rest. The relationship is broken. This came to bear with a a man was talking recently, and he talked about how he left a, a, a seminary because of his position, his doctrinal theological position didn't line up with the school, and it broke relationships. So it was over a doctrinal issue, and friends left, and he says, I still do not have relationships with these people. And I asked him, how are you dealing with that? And he said, it's it's not up to me. He's resting. He's just resting when others will refuse that reconciliation. Augustine said this, God alone is the place of peace that cannot be disturbed. Stand with him and you shall not fall. Rest in him and peace shall be yours. All of us, all of us are seeking peace. We're all in search of peace in our lives. And Jesus is that Savior of the world that brought glory to God by being peace for us. We have peace with God, peace within ourselves, and peace with others. That portion of Scripture in Luke 2 ends with the shepherds. It says they heard and then they saw the child in Bethlehem. And they left there praising and glorifying God. Similar to the way that the angels, the host, the heavenly host, announcing the coming of the Jesus Christ, the one who was the peacemaker, the Prince of Peace, and they cried out, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. This is great news, and this is the news we celebrate this day. May you have peace in your heart and peace with God, and may you have peace with others 
And if you're not, may you rest knowing he is still the Prince of Peace and we serve him and he loves you. Father, thank you for your great love to us. We don't understand it. We're baffled by it. But you love us and you show grace and you show mercy and you give us peace. And we didn't deserve any of it. You gave it to us freely through your son, Jesus Christ. And so now, Lord, we bow before you as the Prince of Peace. We give you thanks and praise and may we be glorifying and may we image the one who gave peace for your glory and your honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name.